Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about linear functions and models. So in this section, we're actually going to talk about the simplest type of function called a linear function that is expressed by an algebraic expression where the variables raised to the first power, or exponent 1. We've already seen how to solve linear equations where the exponent on the variable is 1. However, now we're going to learn how to determine models that represent situations where a function has a constant rate of change. So in this video, we're going to talk about identifying whether a function is linear, and also if it's a linear function, determine its slope and y-intercept, and also to construct a linear model from a rate of change given in a verbal description. So linear functions. Recall that a linear function is a function of this form, f of x equals mx plus b, or ax plus b. In other words, it's a function where the independent variable is raised to the first power, so notice that x is raised to the first power, or exponent 1, and the a is the coefficient, or the number in front of the x, and b is a constant term. We also know that the graph of this type of function, the linear function, will be a line, and the slope of the line will be the number a, and the y-intercept of the graph will be the number b. So the definition of a linear function. A linear function is a function of this form, f of x equals ax plus b. So you can identify the slope, the number a, and you can also identify the y-intercept b just by looking at the function's formula, f of x equals ax plus b, or mx plus b. The graph of the linear function is a line, the slope is the number a, and the y-intercept is the number b. So example one, we're going to identify which of the following are linear functions and which ones are not. So determine whether the given functions are linear. If the function is linear, express the function in the form f of x equals ax plus b. So number one, the function is f of x equals 3 sevenths times the quantity 1 subtract 2x in parentheses. So notice in this function that we can simplify by taking 3 sevenths and distribute through the set of parentheses to each term. And so 3 sevenths times 1 will give you 3 sevenths. 3 sevenths times negative 2x will give you negative 6 sevenths x. And then you can rearrange the terms so that the x term is first. So you have negative 6 sevenths x plus 3 sevenths. That's the function. And so yes, this is of the form for a linear function. The number for the x will be the slope. So a is negative 6 sevenths. And the b is 3 sevenths, the y-intercept. Number two, the function is g of x equals 2x times the quantity 4x subtract 1. So again, we have a set of parentheses that we need to distribute the 2x through to remove the parentheses. So 2x times 4x will give you 8x squared, and 2x times negative 1 will give you negative 2x. Notice that the highest power on the variable is 2, so this is not a linear function. It's what's called a quadratic function. So this function will not have a constant rate of change. Number 3, the function is h of x equals 8 subtract 7x in the numerator of a fraction, and 4 is the denominator. You can rewrite this function so you have two different fractions. You have 8 divided by 4 is one term, and then you have another term that is subtract 7x divided by 4. And so 8 fourths can be simplified just the whole number 2, and then negative 7 fourths, and then times x. That's the other term. So negative 7 fourths x plus 2. This is of the form for a linear function. So the slope, the number a, will be negative 7 fourths for the linear function, and the y-intercept, the number b, is 2. And then the last one, number 4, you have a function k of x is equal to another fraction. You have 5x subtract 1 in the numerator, but this time you have 3x in the denominator. So again, let's break this up into two different fractions. 5x divided by 3x will be one fraction. Subtract 1 divided by 3x will be the second fraction. 5x divided by 3x can be simplified to just 5 thirds because you have x divided by x, that's 1. And then the other fraction is subtract 1 divided by 3x. So the first term is 5 thirds. Notice in the second term, or second fraction, that the x is in the denominator, not the numerator. So this is really x to the negative 1 power, because it's in the denominator of the fraction. So this does not have x to the first power, it has x to the negative first power. So this is not a linear function, it's what's called a rational function. So now that we know what linear function will look like, let's actually talk about slope and rate of change. If we have a function f of x is equal to ax plus b, and that's a linear function, if you have x1 and x2 are two different x values or input values, and y1 is the output value when you plug x1 in to the function, and y2 is the output value for the function at x2, you actually generate two points that are on the graph of this function. You have x1 comma y1 is one point, and x2 comma y2 is another point. So from the definition of slope, that we know that we can actually calculate slope if we have two points on the graph, and so or the average rate of change that we talked about in the previous video, the slope is y2 subtract y1, or the change in the y values, divided by x2 subtract x1, or the change in the x values. Rise divided by run is another way of thinking about slope. Well, discussing this as it relates to the previous video, when we talked about average rate of change, the y2 was the output value of the function at x2, and y1 was the output value when we plugged in x1 to the function. 
So the numerator is really f of x2 subtract f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1 in the denominator. This was the definition for average rate of change. So calculating the slope of a function at two different points on the graph is actually finding the average rate of change of the function on that interval from x1 to x2. So the definition of slope and rate of change for a linear function, f of x equals ax plus b, the slope of the graph of the function, f of x, and the rate of change of the function are both equal to this number a, the coefficient or the number in front of the x term. If you're talking about a linear function's graph, the slope of that line will be a, the number a, and it's also the rate of change of the function is also a. So making and using linear models. When we know that we have a linear function that can actually model the relationship between the two variables or two quantities, the slope of the graph of the function is the average rate of change as we just discussed, and the average rate of change actually is a measure between the one quantity as it respects to the other quantity. So for example, the graph below will actually show the amount of gas in a tank that is being filled at a constant rate or a constant rate of change. If you want to calculate the constant rate of change or the slope, the number a, notice from this graph that we're actually using that the x values will change between the two indicated points by three minutes. One point is at three minutes, the other point is at six minutes, and so there's a difference of three minutes, so that's the denominator, the time elapsed, and the numerator is actually the change in the y values. In this case, the y values are representing how much gas are in the tank. That's in gallons, so one value is at 12 gallons, the other value is at 6 gallons, so 12 minus 6 will give you 6 gallons over those 3 minutes, and so there's 2 gallons per minute. In other words, the slope is the rate at which the tank is being filled, so the tank is being filled at 2 gallons per minute. So in the other figure, notice that if we have the two points, at one point is at 100 minutes, and it looks like there's 15 gallons of gas in the tank, and then the other point is when there's 200 minutes, and the amount of gas in the tank is 12 gallons, if you calculate the rate of change between these two set of points, or the slope between these two points on the graph, you'll notice that there's 100 minutes between the two different points, 100 minutes and 200 minutes, there's a gap of 100 minutes, or that's the time elapsed, and then there's a difference in the y values, or the output values, of 3 gallons. Notice that the gallons actually decreased by 3. It actually was 15 gallons at 100 minutes, and then it decreased to 12 gallons at 200 minutes. So notice that the constant rate of change, or the slope of this line in terms of the graph, is actually negative 3 for the numerator, and the denominator is 100 minutes. So that would be negative 3 divided by 100, or negative 0.03 gallons per minute. So in example 2, we're going to make a linear model from a rate of change. So suppose that water is being pumped into a swimming pool at a rate of 5 gallons per minute. There are initially 200 gallons of water already in the swimming pool. So number 1, find a linear function. The output value is not y. In this case, it will be v for volume of water in the swimming pool. It models the volume of water in the swimming pool after t minutes. So again, we're not using x this time because they're telling us the variable is t, representing time in minutes. So why does this describe a linear function? Well, notice that the amount of water that's being pumped into the swimming pool is actually adding 5 gallons per minute. That's a constant rate of change. So this can be described using a linear function. So a constant rate of change, the slope, would be 5 gallons per minute added into the swimming pool. Notice that the slope is a positive number because the water is actually being added to the swimming pool. So the volume is actually increasing. And we also need to know how much was actually in the pool originally. So the initial amount in the pool was 200 gallons of water. And so now we have both pieces that we need for the linear function. The function is v of t. It would be slope times t plus b, the initial value. And so the function would be v of t is equal to 5 times t plus 200. That would be a linear model that would describe the relationship of water being pumped into the swimming pool. Number two, if the swimming pool has the capacity of 600 gallons, how long will it take for the swimming pool to be filled to capacity? We're going to use our function that we just obtained, the linear model, which was v of t equals 5t plus 200. When will the volume reach 600 gallons? So that's the output value that they're actually giving us in the problem it will actually be equal to 600 for the volume. So take your function or your model and set it equal to 600 gallons. It will be 5t plus 200 is equal to 600, and now you want to solve this equation in terms of t, and so get t by itself, subtract both sides by 200 to get 5t equals 400, and then divide both sides of the equation by 5, and that will give you t equals 80, and time was in minutes, so this is 80 minutes. The swimming pool will be filled to capacity of 600 gallons after 80 minutes if it's actually constantly being filled at 5 gallons per minute. 
and there were originally were 200 gallons of water in the swimming pool. All right, let's look at this next example. Example three is modeling straight line depreciation. So book value is the value of an asset that a company uses to create a balance sheet. Some companies depreciate their assets using straight line depreciation and the value of the asset declines by a fixed amount each year. So in other words, a constant rate of change. The amount of the decline depends on the useful life of that asset that the company places. So let's say we have an iPhone. The iPhone was purchased for $799. After four years, the calculated value or the book value of the iPhone is $449. Part one, build a linear model that expresses the book value, capital V, so that's the output value or the function's name, of the iPhone as a function of its age, which is given as X. So notice in this problem, compared to the last example, we don't have the constant rate of change. We only have two pieces of information given in the problem. The original price of the phone was $799, and after four years, it depreciated to $449. So let's calculate the constant rate of change, or the slope, between these two set of points. So notice that the slope will be the new value of the phone, $449, subtract the old value, $799, that it was actually purchased for, divided by how much time has elapsed, or its age. Four years was the value at $449, subtract zero, which is the original price of the phone. So in the numerator, you'll have negative 350, and the denominator is 4. So negative 350 divided by 4 is negative 87.5. Now in terms of the context of the problem, that means that the phone is actually depreciating or losing value of $87.50 per year. So notice that the slope or the constant rate of change for this problem is actually negative. That indicates that the value is actually losing value or depreciating over time. And so our linear function or linear model would look like this. Capital V for the value of the phone is the output value. So V of X is equal to slope times X plus B or the initial value. So V of X is equal to negative 87.5 times X plus the initial value of the phone plus $799. Okay, part two. What is the slope of the linear function? Well, we just found that out. The slope is negative 87.5. That means that the value of the phone is depreciating $87.50 per year over its lifetime. What is the implied domain and range of the function found in the previous part? Notice that the function actually will depreciate over time and eventually the value of the phone will be zero dollars. You'll never have a value of the phone be a negative amount. Eventually the phone will be zero dollars in value and it will never go negative after that. It'll just stay zero dollars. That will be the useful life of the phone. So since the age of the phone can only be a positive number, we know that X will be greater than or equal to zero, but eventually the phone will continue to depreciate and eventually the value of the phone will be zero dollars. Let's find out when that actually occurs. So if the value of the phone can be described as this linear model, negative 87.5x plus 799, so solve the equation for x, so subtract $799 on the other side of the equation, and then divide both sides of the equation by negative 87.5. So after about 9.131 years, the value of the phone will be $0. And so our implied domain, what are all the set of input values that make up the function and actually have the function actually make sense in this context, is that the value of the phone can be zero or larger, but then no larger than 9.131 years old. After that, the value of the phone will no longer depreciate because then it will not actually lose any value. It's already zero dollars. And then the implied range is actually zero dollars for the output value, and also the largest value that the phone will actually reach is $799, its original price. So zero to $799 is the implied range. And then part three, According to the linear model, when will the book value, or the value of the phone, be $250? Round your answer to two decimal places. So we just did this in terms of $0 for the value of the phone. Now let's do the same thing, but this time the value of the phone is $250. When will that occur? So the value of the function was described by this linear model, negative 87.5 times x plus $799. When will that actually be $250? So again, this is an equation that you can actually solve for x to find out when will this actually occur. What will the age of the phone be when the value will be $250? So solve the equation, subtract $799 on the other side of the equation, and so you have negative 87.5 is equal to negative 549, and then divide both sides of the equation by negative 87.5, and then you'll have x is about 6.274 years, or if you want to round the two decimal places, you'll be 6.27 years. So a little over six and a quarter years, the phone will actually be valued at $250.
All right, in example four, we're going to make linear models that actually represents the speed. So suppose that John and Mary are driving westward along I-96 at constant speeds. The graphs below show the distance y in miles that they have traveled from Lansing, Michigan at time x in hours. So x equals zero will correspond to the time 12 p.m. So we have John and Mary driving westward along I-96 starting at 12 p.m. John has already traveled 150 miles west of Lansing, Michigan at noon. So John has already driven 150 miles already when x equals zero, the time. So notice from the graph that John starts at 0, 150 because at time equals zero, he's already 150 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. Whereas Mary is actually starting in Lansing, Michigan and she has not driven at all. So that'd be 0, 0. Notice that we have graphs for both the distance that John has driven and also the distance that Mary has driven. So we have a couple points that we can identify from the graph. After two hours, so 2 p.m., Mary is at 150 miles driven and John is 250 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. And then after four hours, so whenever x equals four, we have Mary at 300 miles driven and John is that 350 miles driven. So part one, at what speeds are John and Mary traveling? Who is traveling faster and how does this show up in the graph? So let's calculate John's rate of change or John's speed first. So John's rate of change is a slope or average rate of change. The slope can be determined using any two points on the graph. So I'm going to use this point at 2, 250 and also the initial value or the y-intercept at 0, 150. Notice that the y values, the output values, they were 250 subtract 150, so that's a distance of 100 miles driven over those two hours. So 2 subtract 0 in the denominator. And so John's average speed over the first two hours is 100 divided by 2 or 50 miles per hour. And notice the graph that represents John's distance that he actually has driven is a linear function. It's a line. So there's a constant rate of change, and so that means that John is always driving 50 miles per hour. On the other hand, Mary's rate of change, or Mary's speed that she's driving, the constant rate of change, or the slope, can be calculated using any two points on the graph that represents Mary. And so I'm going to again use the first two points. We have a point at 2, 150, and the other point is at 0, 0, because Mary started out in Lansing, Michigan. So 0 miles at time equals 0. So the slope would be 150 subtract 0 in the numerator, so 150. The denominator would be 2 minus 0 the time elapsed, so that would be 2. And so 150 divided by 2 is 75. So Mary's speed is 75 miles per hour. And again, notice that the graph that represents Mary's distance driven is actually a straight line, so that's a linear function. And so it will also be a constant rate of change. So Mary is always driving 75 miles per hour. So Mary is actually driving faster because it looks like the slope of the line that represents Mary's distance is actually increasing at a faster rate than compared to John. All right, number two, now that we know what John and Mary's constant rate of change is, let's construct linear functions that model the distances that John and Mary have traveled as functions of x, where x is hours after 12 p.m. So John, that's going to be a linear function because we had a constant rate of change. We'll use capital J to represent John. So John's distance at time x, x hours after 12 p.m. will be 50 was the constant rate of change for John's speed, so 50 times x plus the initial value for John was 150 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. So j of x is equal to 50 times x plus 150. And then Mary was also represented by a linear function because the graph is a straight line and then also there's a constant rate of change of 75 miles per hour. So capital M will be representing Mary's distance driven. And so capital M of x is equal to 75 times x, the constant rate of change times x, Plus, notice that Mary actually started in Lansing, Michigan, so she's driven zero miles when x equals zero. So that'd be 75x plus zero, or just 75x after you simplify. So when x is the number of hours driven after 12 p.m., these are the two functions that represent John's distance and also Mary's distance driven. So number three, how far will John and Mary have traveled at 5 p.m.? 5 p.m. is five hours after 12 p.m., which was when x equals zero. So 5 p.m. would be x equals five. So let's substitute 5 into the function that represents John's distance and also substitute 5 into capital M function because that represents Mary's distance. John's distance traveled after 5 hours would be capital J of 5. That would be 50 times 5 for the x value plus 150. That turns out to be 400 miles. So at 5 p.m., John has driven 400 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. Whereas Mary, capital M of 5, after you plug 5 into the function 75 times x, that would be 75 times 5. That would be 375 miles. So Mary has driven 375 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. 
And in part four, for what time period is Mary behind John? Will Mary overtake John? If so, at what time will this occur? So we need to actually determine when Mary and John will actually have driven the same number of miles. So that would be when the two functions are actually equal to one another. So capital M of X is equal to capital J of X. Set these two functions equal to one another. 75X was representing the distance that Mary has driven. And 50X plus 150 was the distance that John has driven. Set these two equal to one another. And now you have an equation that you can actually solve for X to find out at what time this will actually occur when the distances are the same. So 75X equals 50X plus 150. Subtract 50X to the left side of the equation to get the X terms on the same side. So you have 25X equals 150. And then divide both sides of the equation by 25 to get X equals 6 hours. And so 6 hours after 12 p.m. or 6 p.m., Mary's distance and John's distance will be exactly the same. So that means before 6 hours, we know that Mary actually started in Lansing, Michigan, whereas John started 150 miles west of Lansing, Michigan at 12 p.m. And so John is actually ahead of Mary on the highway between 12 p.m. and then until 6 p.m. when they actually have driven the same number of miles. After 6 p.m., Mary will overtake John in terms of distance, and so Mary will always stay out in front of John in terms of the highway after that. So this finishes our video on linear functions and models. We have talked about how to identify linear functions in terms of its constant rate of change or its slope and also the y-intercept. And we've also talked about how to construct a linear model using its rate of change. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about transformations of functions.